Welcome to Charter California Edition. I'm Brad Pomerantz. We are now joined by Gloria Negretti McLeod. She is a member of the United States Congress. And recently there was a very significant vote in the United States House. And it's known as the Ryan Murphy budget vote. Um, many folks are hailing it as an example of bipartisanship. The vote was quite lopsided. A nice number of Democrats and Republicans came out in favor. But the congresswoman in front of me came out against. Why is that? Well, it didn't have everything that I thought a budget should have. It did not extend the most important thing, the unemployment insurance for all of those people in California, which is at the end of uh, December, it mm. was going to affect 200,000 Californians. Yeah. And let's talk about that because that has been a major source of contention. You are not the only Democratic member who voted against the Ryan Murphy budget because of the question of the extension of unemployment benefits for the long-term unemployed. And as you may know, Governor Brown recently came out um, urging the United States Congress, the United States Senate to extend the unemployment benefits for the long-term unemployed. Why is it that this element in your mind did not make it into the final budget? Who knows? There was two people negotiating. Literally. Each, truly, it was a bipartisan, but two people, <laughs> right. one from each party. Right. Senator Murray from Washington and, and of course, Congressman Paul, Paul, Paul Ryan. Ryan from Wisconsin. So. And so, is there anything that can be done on this issue? Well, I hope so. I hope uh, soon that we will go back and when, uh, we will vote on to extend this insurance. I mean, by God. You talk about uh, weakening the economy, those people that can't uh, buy things, they can't right. do that. Not only is it the 200,000 here in California, but it'll be 800,000 a little bit later on. So that is a lot, that's a million Californians. So what happens to these people? Do they then become eligible for welfare? I, I mean, I imagine so, but uh, my God, can you imagine? You have a family and suddenly you have this little tiny bit of money right. and it's suddenly taken away. I mean, could one argue that this actually is not very cost effective because if you take away their long-term unemployment, they wind up on the welfare rolls, which becomes more expensive? Well, that's my supposition. Mm -hmm. So that's why I decided that I was not going to vote for it. And it also did it keep 75% of the sequester cuts yes, still in place? that's an interesting issue because there has been some discussion about the sequester. And this is a continuing resolution, right. not, you know, not a budget for two years. Again. So, come on. Yes. But let's talk about that sequester element because there was a lot of discussion about the sequester earlier in the year mm -hmm. and how draconian the cuts were. And we heard a lot of horror stories about what the sequester was going to do. There were some fixes with regard to airlines and other matters, but as a general proposition, I don't know, the sky didn't fall down per se. So do you feel as if maybe the sequester in the end may have been a good thing? It, it helps them bring some fiscal discipline, bring down the budget deficit? No, I, I didn't vote for the sequester because I wasn't there uh, when yes. they voted for the sequester. We mm -hmm. just had the after effects of the sequester right. that's ongoing. In my district, anybody that deals with the government was affected by sequester. Of so it's not a good thing. Right. Are you pleased, though, that some of the sequester cuts were frozen, eliminated? Well, for some, yes. But again, it did nothing to raise the debt ceiling. Did nothing. So we're going to go back whenever we go back into, right. into session, and we're going to have to deal with these problems. So this was not the, the best to fix everything. It's so interesting that it's been painted as a huge harbinger for the future, that finally the parties have come together. And if you look at it, it Maybe not. It's all relative. I mean, sure, th this is nice for 2013-14, for but when you think about what was happening in the last decade, this would have been laughable because in terms of putting it up as, as the example of bipartisanship. Well, uh, again, bipartisan by two people, but it wasn't right. what I was willing to vote for. So I took a chance and I said, no, I'm not voting for this. I want to speak with you, if I may, about the Affordable Care Act and the rollout of it. Uh, there's no question that California is facing, experiencing a different rollout than the rest of the nation, or at least those states that are focused on healthcare.gov as their portal. What's your sense of how Cover California has done, especially as a member of the United States Congress? Well, we're one of the few states that did our own, you know, uh, I don't know what it's called. Look at the portal, Ken yeah. Yeah, the yeah. Kentucky is also Right, Kentucky's real good. done very well. Yes, and, and a couple of other states, but mm -hmm. I'm only concerned with California. Right. And so California has done a pretty good rollout. Mm -hmm. Is it the best thing? No, there's still some tweaks and fixes, but I don't know. I, I think at last count that I heard, 
it was like about, I don't know, 700,000, and I'm sure it's going up. There was a, a, a newspaper article that said that in the month of November that it had gone up. Right. There's, There's still some stuff. Um, but yeah, we still have to get people to, to go and understand that this I, is I want to talk about one segment of our society, and that's Latinos. Um, I know within your district there is a significant Latino population. We think about the entire state of California, about 29% of our state are Latinos. Mm -hmm. um, yet when you look at the statistics for those enrolling in Covered California, maybe 3%, 5% are Latinos and or Spanish speakers. That's incredibly low when you look at their general population figures. What's happening in your mind? Why are Latinos not signing up through Covered um, California? I really don't know mm -hmm. what the answer is, but don't forget that probably about 75% of the people that have insurance are covered by employers. That is true. So this is only a small right. uh, minority of people. But what that we do know is Latinos, though, are uninsured at a disproportionate rate. Mm -hmm. And so, you know, are you... Are you hearing, are you seeing that there's some, uh, Latinos are unclear about the process, there's a digital divide between, you know, Latinos and their Caucasian counterparts, they don't have access to the internet, so they can't sign up to, for Cover California. What, what is it? I don't know that that's a truism. Uh -huh. I, I don't know what the answer is, but uh, I'm going to have to call somebody no, no, and find out no, what it no, is. No, but it's, it's, it's an interesting issue. Another issue that I know ha faces you and your district, re considering that you represent significant portions of the Inland Empire, uh, the foreclosure crisis. Mm -hmm. We have turned the corner, though. I think it's fair to say we've turned the corner. Yes, but there's still quite a few people that are still in are going to be nearing that crisis of foreclosure. Right, and so you've recently held a, are you held or you're going to hold? No, a, we held. You we held, held it, a free home rescue fair. Why don't you tell me all about that? I'm fascinated to hear. Well, we we did a lot of outreach. We, had, we sent a lot of letters out to people that are on the verge of foreclosure. Right. And the funny part is we only had about 30 people that showed up. Really? Mm -hmm. Why is that? What do you think? I don't know. I don't know how you get people to come into these free things. Right. We had counselors. We had the banks there ready to, to actually help them, and we didn't have people show well, up. Well, but of the 30 that did show up, I mean, were, did they see relief? Were they able to get? Uh, we will have a follow-up in right. my own office where we will have counselors there that will do the follow-up. Uh, the people that hold foreclosure uh, that have been doing this say that we have people that come in, but they don't go the next step to actually follow up. I want to talk to you about the last year. You had been a member of the California State Assembly, a member of the California State Senate. You are now a member of the United States Congress. As you reflect on the last year of your life as a member of the United States Congress, what could you tell us about your time there? I have to think it's a very different body than Sacramento. What are the similarities? What are the differences? Well, it's, it's different that it's quite not as structured as the state legislature. Really? Who mm -hmm. would have thought that Sacramento would be called structured? That we're very structured. You do things in, in order there. It's mm -hmm. not quite as ordered as, as I would have thought. Right. But uh, everybody tells me that, it, that they hold the way they do things to the way the British do it, and so How they, interesting. Yes, that's, that's what I've been told. Okay. So I don't know how much truth there okay, is to that's that. Fair. And what about, you know, you had been part of a very significant majority as Absolutely. a Democrat in Sacramento. Now you're part of a minority as a member of the U.S. Congress. How is being on that other side for you? Very different. It is, yes. Very, very different. Now I know how the other side is. <laughs> right, no doubt. Yeah. And do you feel as if you can effectuate change as a member of the minority party, or do you feel as if minority rights in terms of political parties in Washington are, are, are not well defined? I don't think they're as well defined as I would wish. I, mm -hmm. You know, we, everybody that runs says they're going to, they hold the banner and, and they say they're going to go in and change things. It's very hard for one person to change things. What really about is. creating friendships, relationships? Is that the Well, ticket? you do that all the time right. in whatever kind of job I hear you have. You. Okay, her name is Gloria Negretti McLeod. She is a member of the United States Congress. My name is Brad Pomerantz. We're going to be right back on Charter California Edition.
Welcome back to Charter California Edition. I'm Brad Pomerantz. Our guest, Wendy McCammack, she is running for mayor in San Bernardino. The general election will be held on February 4th. Uh, top two candidates have advanced. You're one of the two. And I want to speak with you about your city. You spent 13 years on the city council. You lived through the filing of the bankruptcy. I'm sure you're aware that Detroit is going through bankruptcy. Yes. And in Detroit, there was a ruling by a federal bankruptcy judge which indicated that Detroit could use its bankruptcy laws to roll back pensions uh, and promises to retirees. That is a huge ruling. As a former lawyer, I guess I still am a lawyer, huge. I mean, sent shockwaves throughout the entire nation. Yes, it did. As well as, as San Bernardino. What's your sense of this ruling? Well, I think that it does have retirees worried, as it should. Uh, I think retirees have been worried from day one of right. filing of the bankruptcy prior to the Detroit ruling, which may only makes sense in that the city's then responsibil responsibility for the continued unfunded liability requires that if they don't make those payments, that something has to give, and they know that the payments made to retirees would have to give. Right. Uh, Do you feel as if pensions was one of the main reasons why San Bernardino got pushed into bankruptcy because there's some debate on that about right. the weight of pensions. Right. And a lot of folks point to pensions and see if we hadn't given all those concessions in the early 2000s, we wouldn't be here right. today. Well, What's let me give you a little bit of history, R real quick history. No, please. Uh, for many years, the California retirement system, PERS, let's just right. call it Cal PERS, PERS yeah. for the viewer's purposes, mm -hmm. uh, had made the structure so that cities had to pay in certain percentages based on their earnings, okay. PERS's overall earnings in their investment accounts. So their board set the rates for each municipality or, or special Got district. It. Got it. So based on that, cities were then told, you pay this amount per, per year for this year. When PERS made their financial mistakes, which were huge, right. they then said, okay, well, we can't hit you cities for our mistakes all in one, all in one mm -hmm. felt swoop. So we're going to smooth out your payments over the next three to five years, or we're gonna re-amortize them over longer periods of time into the future, which raised our payments to no fault of the right. cities. Okay, that said, there are other issues that add to pension unfunded liabilities. We actually took out a pension obligation bond. We mm -hmm. did that in advance of knowing that PERS was not managing their funds correctly. So if we could stagnate the, the interest rate to that bond, that would then pay up some of that unfunded liability. That would, meant our future payments would be lower. Well, in effect, that's what happened. And the bond went through. The bond went through. It actually did lower. Overall, it lowered the payments that would have normally been made right. on that unfunded liability. But? No buts. That's it. However, when PERS then has more retirees going into the system because people are living longer. Of course, yes. It's just like Social Security. The amount of money necessary to make those monthly payments out of the PERS fund, it requires cities to pay more to make those payments. Okay, so that's one perspective Got in it. terms of the bankruptcy. But listening to the mayor a couple of weeks ago at a mm -hmm. neighborhood meeting, he clearly laid out that the removal of California redevelopment agencies mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. created a, a large problem for the city. It, Would you agree with that? I do partially agree okay. with that. It halted redevelopment, right. which created tax increment, right. which created tax base, which created jobs. Catalytic consequences. It's right. a, it's a right. very big circular effect. Right. And uh, that, was, that was number right. two. Uh, no, number three, when you've got 50% rental, uh, rental units, you've got 50% poverty, you've got a lack of d disposable income. You've got foreclosures. You've got, uh, you've got mm. 7,000 vacant low-income units in the city. All of that equals a lack of, of a pile of money right. to spend on the essentials. That, pile, that lack of a pile of money was multifold. And I think to blame it on one thing is unfair, but in, in terms of, of morality, Excuse me. In terms of no, I understand uh, what you're saying. Yeah, yeah. I mean, uh, you feel as if there's a moral obligation to pay what you promise to pay to current retirees. To current, that's the key. That that was negotiated. If you want to look at a two-tier system for which we did, and we've, imp we've implemented. Okay. Yes. And so, but that is a, that's tricky. I mean, what the Detroit court is saying is not necessarily right. So I think the key for the retirees. And the key for the voters, uh, 
some right. of which are retirees, yes, no doubt, need to understand that your next set of elected officials are the ones that are going to negotiate with the current labor groups, including a group of retirees, through the mediator, finally to the bankruptcy judge. And what has to be put on the platter is a multitude of things that will fix this bankruptcy, a multitude of reorganizations within, within what is owed. And I think if you do that and you do it properly and you get CalPERS to agree to a longer term amortization, which is exactly what they've done to us year right. after year, we then, I think, can make those payments to the it, retirees as promised. It's interesting. In the wake of the Detroit ruling, CalPERS became very public and they talked about how they disagree with the ruling. You know, I read between the lines, and it seems to me they're a little nervous by it. Uh, frankly, they are. Yeah. Funny, however, at the last bankruptcy hearing, which I attended right. as a non-elected official. Right, right. Uh, I, but running I, for mayor. Well, I feel yeah. it's still important. Right. Um, all of our investments are in that city. Everything that affects the city of in of affects us. And what I noticed was that all of a sudden, everybody, after two days of mediation, everybody on either side, all sides, said, we're very encouraged by what's what was what was discussed we're very encouraged with what the city put on the table so what i'm wondering is is the city giving away the farm mm -hmm. and if the city's giving away the farm then they're not negotiating properly in my opinion in a way that would benefit as many people as possible who who are the negotiators on the city side uh well it's the bankruptcy attorney okay okay the uh it hired labor negotiator who is a lawyer okay. outside lawyer uh, the mayor was there. Okay. Uh, the fourth ward councilman, Mr. Charette, was there. Okay. Uh, the city finance consultant was there. The city finance director was there. I believe the city manager was there. Eight people went there. Okay. And, and they have been selected to be the negotiating team? Um, I would not know because right. I wasn't on the council but, when they chose. But, well, what about prior? I mean... There was no prior. These are the first round of negotiations. The two days before Thanksgiving or the three days right. before Thanksgiving, they went up to Reno and they negotiated. At least they laid on the table right. to the mediator what the ideas were at that point. What's interesting is that was before the Detroit ruling. Yes, sir, it And was. so it's interesting. I wonder what will happen if they'll change their position. Well, I think CalPERS is also constitutionally uh, intertwined to right. the state constitution. Yeah, no doubt. And the Detroit City pension fund is not yes. connected to the Detroit state constitution. Right. So I think Michelle, therein right. lies a partial uh, distinction set of wiggle mm -hmm. room, if mm -hmm. you want to call it that. I do know, however, that retirees need to understand and the public needs to understand that when this, your city elected officials made a promise to current retirees, some of, some of whom make very little money on their right. pensions, we have a moral obligation to make sure that we don't put them into poverty. As you may also know, the mayor of San Jose, Chuck Reed, yes. is promoting a ballot initiative to give government agencies more leeway to impose cuts in pensions. Yes. And you know the wording is still up for debate, but surely what he is looking at is for current employees. He wants to be able to break open the contracts courts have held for decades you cannot break open a current contract without a negotiation but I, he, unless there's unless there's not a zipper clause right unless there's a side letter that says we can open right. and both parties agree to it which in some cases we've done that that is true and and I think that's important that's an important tool but I also think that if the voters give a mandate and it's a and it's a clear-cut uh, argument to the voters they truly understand what it all truly means, it may be a good tool in terms of leveraging hmm. negotiation tactics, leveraging... You don't think it gives too much power to the government? Um, well, first of all, it's taxpayers' money. And in my opinion, you have a fiduciary responsibility to protect those taxpayers' money. And if that's a tool that you need, depending on how it I understand. comes down yeah, devil the, the pike, details. Devil, big time devil in the Her details. name is Wendy McCammick. She is a candidate for mayor of San Bernardino. That election will be held on February 4th. I'm Brad Palmer. It's his Charter California edition.
Welcome back. It's Charter California Edition. I'm Brad Pomerantz. We are joined by Ilham Masoudi. She is a professor at UCR's New Medical School. Congratulations to the New Medical School, of course. And we know our friends who work in politics will often enjoy wine at dinner. And so there's a big debate about how much wine one can consume. It's become lore that, oh, a glass a day is actually good for you. You're here to talk to us about that. Again, congratulations, though, on UCR Med. Thank you. How's Thank it going? How's the it's New Medical great. School? It's great. So fantastic. We, our first class is just full of amazing and intelligent and super motivated students. I, I was imagine. actually block one co-coordinator this year. Which and, means? Um, so I helped organize the first block of didactics with the wow, students and wow. it, it just an incredible experience. It's fantastic. So let's talk about the study that you recently issued. It's in Vaccine Magazine and you were looking at how wine impacts vaccinations. And the reason why that is helpful in terms of the study is because you're looking at immune responses. Absolutely. Begin. Yeah, so <laughs> we actually did not specifically look at a wine versus oh, that's true. beer versus alcohol. I misspoke. That's okay. It's alcohol. <laughs> it's alcohol. Right. Um, but yes, we are, the goal of the study was to investigate the impact of ethanol consumption on the immune system and our ability to respond to a vaccination. And as you know, vaccinations are very important this time yes. of the year. Hopefully everyone has gone right. out there and gotten their flu shots. Of course, of course. Um, vaccination is very important for all ages. I cannot stress that enough. Not only is it important for children to prevent childhood diseases such as measles, chicken pox, etc., but it's very important for elderly um, as well. The pneumovax vaccine, right. zoster vaccine, and etc. vaccines nowadays they are no longer live viruses, are they? For the most part, they are inactivated. Inactivated mm -hmm. viruses. But we still have some live attenuated vaccines. Right. They tend to be not recommended for infants or the elderly. I see. For example, the yellow fever vaccine is a live attenuated vaccine. Attenuated meaning? It's still able to replicate, but not as well as the live virus. I understand. So it's enough to get your immune system interested, intrigued, respond to it, form memory. Right. And then when they see the real thing, it can respond to it more robustly. And just to remind our viewers, the way a vaccine works is the exposure. Absolutely, exactly what you said, the exposure to the antigen teaches, trains the immune system to recognize that as something that is foreign and that it needs to be eliminated. And the vaccine um, are safe because they're inactivated right. or they're severely attenuated. Right. So the immune system can get a training session and then when it sees the real virus, it responds quickly and can quench the infection. It's a miracle. I mean, it, to it, me, vaccines is, are miraculous. We don't see things like the plague anymore. Literally because of it. Polio, we've right. almost conquered polio. We were almost. in Syria yes. recently, there was yep. an outbreak. TB is kind yep. of popping around. Yep. Some drug resistance right. strains. Okay, but be that as it may, yep. let's talk about your study because <laughs> yep. you were looking at non-human primates yes. and how the consumption of ethanol, alcohol impacted their immune response. That is correct. Um, and so in this study, we looked at 12 rhesus macaques. Um, these animals were first trained um, to drink just like us humans. Usually we don't just pick a bottle of wine on our no. own or we usually get trained, some of us on college campuses. Oh yes. <laughs> but uh, so the monkeys were initially trained um, they, um, and then they were allowed open access to alcohol, water, and of course open access to food. And what was so fascinating and interesting is the animals um, that were exposed to ethanol segregated into different, two different groups. So on their own, of their own volition, right. they segregated into animals that just drank occasionally and never drank to intoxication, and animals that consistently drank to intoxication. That's a study in itself. Absolutely. <laughs> That's fascinating. Absolutely. And it must say a ton about uh, you know, us, because we're cousins to, exactly. to these non-human Exactly. We share primates. significant right. genetic homology with these animals. Mm -hmm. And so studying why one group became um, heavy drinkers right. versus the group that just stayed as moderate right. is in by itself a very important question. But you were looking at those animals or primates, mm -hmm. those that didn't drink, those that drank moderately, and those that drank to excess. Exactly. And how did that impact the eff efficaciousness of the vaccine? Right. So in this study, we, f we gave them a vac the first this vaccine is a two-dose vaccine. We gave them the first dose prior to any drinking. Was it smallpox? What was it's, it? It's a, yeah, so it's called modified vaccine right. Ankara, and it's used, um, it's against smallpox. Got it. it protects you against smallpox. Um, so we gave them the first dose prior to any drinking, and then after seven months of this open access right. period, we came back and boosted them. We gave them the vaccine again. Which is done standard. Absolutely. Like you always get the boost. Hepatitis B vaccine. Right. You get the booster. Has, you know, a three, it's a three-dose right. vaccine, for instance. Um, and what was, you know, we 
expected to see that the, you know, our expectation was that alcohol would actually dampen the immune response. And we saw that with the animals that drank to excess. Okay. But what was really surprising to us was that the animals that drank to moderation generated a better immune response than the animals that didn't drink at all. <laughs> it's just unbelievable. Yes, absolutely. It was, yes. We, we, that must have just let I me mean, look. I sit, right. sat back in my chair. <laughs> you just can't believe it. No, we uh, and they, these responses were statistically significantly they were, higher. Yeah, they were significant. Um, and so, and both both antibody responses as well as the T cell responses were higher. Those are the two main arms of the immune system. What is moderation? Um, so that's the key to me. What right. is moderation? So in this particular case, we did not define moderation as a specific number of drinks per day. Okay, because every person metabolizes ethanol course, very differently. Right, right. And so for our definition, we use the blood ethanol concentration. Oh, like, we, um, was, like we do yeah, for humans, exactly. exactly. 0.08 or exactly. whatever Exactly, right. that's exactly. So the animals that drank to moderation were in that range of 0.02 to 0.04 for so our study. If, and, if mm -hmm. you could make a comparison mm -hmm. to human consumption, a standard adult male or female, is that a drink or two? It's it's a. Well, for females, it would probably be equivalent to one drink per one day. One drink? No more than that. And then for a male? Uh, probably a couple of drinks, okay. two to three, depending on, again, right, the size, size of the person. But a standard male, maybe Absolutely. one, one and, and then, half or two. Um, so actually, the USDA dietary um, guidelines, right. the, the, the U.S. Department of Agriculture has Got it. a beautiful dietary guideline, and there is a whole section devoted to alcohol, and they define what is one drink for beer, wine, okay. hard liquor, everything. I got it, got and it, okay. Every, you know, if anyone is interested, they could look it up right. and see exactly what is it's the definition. Say, it's the U.S., say it again, U.S. The USDA, the, the U.S. Department of Agriculture. I'll, have to, I'll try to put that on the screen if I Dietary guideline, yeah. um, the newest version is 2010. Uh -huh. And so, what, why? What, why do you think this is? So that's that's exactly where our studies are, are right. going to next. Um, this was a, you know, I went into the study originally thinking that we would only see negative effects and so it would be right. a straightforward study and we could Isn't that more fun though that Absolutely. you found this surprise? This is why I got into science. Exactly, and immunology. Um, and immunology. And it, this opens a whole, a whole right. area of research for us because um, we actually compared the obvious things, like the number of T cells in circulation in the blood of these animals. How many CD8 T cells do they have? CD8, CD8. You... oh, these are like killer T cells. Got it, killer Versus T cells. Versus helper T cells. How many B cells do they have in circulation? What kind of B cells they have? And B we cells can... are? The antibody factories. Got it. Sorry. No, Maybe. that's good, no, no, it's well, good. T cells, most of us know, but okay. continue. Um, and so we compared just the numbers and there was nothing obvious that could explain why the moderate drinkers were doing so well. And it was controlled, so you don't believe it was other factors. So I actually think that, um, and there's lots of literature right. to support this hypothesis, that alcohol consumption changes the epigenetics in our cells. Which means? So it modifies how we transcribe our DNA. Huh. Um, and we know environmental factors, stress, chemical exposure, toxins, um, even adverse events in childhood can change these modifications in our DNA that allows us to, say, make many more copies of one gene or completely represses that right. gene so we just don't make any copies of it. And we have hints. We're just starting to get right. little insights right. into this question. But it seems that different doses of ethanol imprint our DNA in slightly different ways. And so the end result is that our cells make different kinds of transcripts, different Right. kinds of genes come on or come off depending on the dose of ethanol. And in this case, if it's a moderate dose, the transcription seems to be beneficial. Right. And so our next studies are looking at, well, what are the genes that are most affected by this, right. this dose dependent effect? Um, and how does that link back to the actual function of the cells? So it's taking us in a whole new direction. And I'm glad that it wasn't an obvious answer. Like they have more helper T cells. So, I'm, I'm blown away. Um, and then the other exciting thing yes. about this is that if we figure out these little molecular tricks right. that allow the immune system to respond better with moderate alcohol, we can now apply those to people who don't respond well to vaccinations, such as the elderly. You have to come back. <laughs> My name is Brad Palmer, so thank you so much for watching Charter California Edition.